turn to Exodus chapter 4. We got through the first 17 verses in Exodus 4 last week. Uh, we saw at the end of chapter 3 and in all of uh, the first half of chapter 4, God appeared to Moses and he spoke to Moses. We saw that he spoke to him from the midst of the burning bush and God reveals his name to him. I am who I am. And uh, as we saw, as God was placing his calling upon Moses' life, Moses came up with five uh, reasons, really five excuses as to why God was choosing the wrong guy to be the deliverer of the Jews from the nation of Egypt. But as we saw, God had the perfect answer for all of Moses' five excuses. And essentially, the Lord gave Moses the same response to all of his fears, all of his doubts. God simply told Moses, I will certainly be with you. Uh, he, he told him, I will stretch out my hand and do incredible signs and wonders. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you shall do, what you shall say. And so basically, Moses has run out of excuses, and he finally realizes that it's not about him and his weakness. It's about the Lord and the Lord's strength, the Lord's power. And so Moses is finally committed within his heart to obey the Lord. And this is when Moses will really start to experience God's hand upon his life in a very real and powerful way. Uh, the first thing, though, that Moses must do is have his family in order, his household in order, before God will open up the door for him to go back to Egypt. So we pick up in chapter 4, verse 18. We'll get through chapter 5. We'll go through chapter 5 pretty quickly this morning. But in chapter 4, 18, it says, And so Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. So Moses doesn't just go to his father-in-law Jethro and say, See ya, I'm out of here. But he goes and he does things right. He will leave on good terms. He will leave with a good testimony. He will leave with a good reputation. And there's obviously some uh, good biblical principles in this. Uh, Paul says to Timothy when he is appointing uh, bishops, overseers for the church, he says this in 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 through 7, one who rules his own house well. And we're going to see Moses has dropped the ball in this area in a, in a moment. Having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Well, we know he's not a novice. He's 80 years old when God calls him. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Even Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. And so Moses is being faithful to his father-in-law. Uh, besides, Jethro has been his boss for 40 years. I mean, he has been tending his father-in-law's sheep all this time. And I'm sure that Moses explained to Jethro all that God told him at the burning bush, all that he was commissioning him to do, and... Uh, by the way, as we go through Exodus, we'll see that Jethro is really a good and godly man. He was a Midianite, but he believed in the Lord, and he trusted the Lord, and he'll give Moses some great advice later on in his life. And so as Moses talks with him and asks him for his blessing, Jethro simply says here, go in peace. Look at verse 19. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on, on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So he's got the staff of God that he's going to be used, uh, that will be used for mighty miracles later on. And so initially, it looks like Moses and his whole family, his wife Zipporah and his two sons, are going with him back to Egypt. 
Now, in a moment, we're going to see they have a little friction going on in their marriage. In fact, Moses and Zipporah will uh, be separated for about a year. Now, when it comes to ministry, it's very important that the household is working together. The husband and wife need to be working as a team because, once again, Satan will attack a couple. He will attack a family. As soon as they step out in faith and say, here I am, Lord, use me, then the enemy will go on the attack. He does not want to see people in ministry, and that's why it's so important to be equally yoked together together in your marriage before you step out in faith and say yes to Jesus. Uh, when you say, here I am, send me, like Isaiah, you better have your household in order. And I can say with all confidence that I would not be in this place of ministry without Elizabeth. Uh, even though she is behind the scenes most of the time, she is a huge part of Calvary Chapel Grand Junction. Uh, but what a blessing she's been to me, and I know she's been a tremendous blessing to many of you in here over the years as well. But even when we're on the same page, the enemy doesn't care. He doesn't care when you're walking together. He still wants to attack. He still wants to bring in discouragement. He wants to bring in frustration. Uh, he knows uh, if he can attack the leadership, not just me, but the elders and wives and everybody else, then he can try to hamper and hinder what the church is doing. So I say that to say thank you to you guys for continually praying for us. Uh, we've been in ministry for 34 years. We started Calvary Chapel 34 years ago, and God is good. He's very faithful. He's gracious. But let's face it, every single one of you in here who's born again, you have a target on your back because Satan hates you. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Since he lost your soul to Jesus, the next thing he does is try to neutralize you in your effectiveness for the kingdom of God. He will try to trip you up. He'll try to get you going back to old habits and lifestyles and different things because he'll do everything possible to keep you quiet about Jesus. He'll try to silence you at work. He'll, he'll try to get you to go back to those places of compromise. So this is why it's so important that we put on and we keep on the whole armor of God because we are in a spiritual battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not a battle against Washington, D.C. Our battle is against the principalities in this world. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and a lot of times they'll manifest themselves through those lovely people in Washington. But it's a spiritual battle. Always remember that. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then Paul goes into all the different pieces of the armor that we are to put on. And, it's, and he, all those different pieces speak of truth. It speaks of righteousness. It speaks of the gospel. It speaks of salvation, the word of God, prayer, perseverance. He says, above all, faith, the shield of faith that you can extinguish to all the fiery darts of the evil one. So how do we stand strong in these important areas in our walk with Jesus? By being in the word of God by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, by being like we are today, with one another, encouraging each other, the body of Christ, building each other up, praying for one another, blessing one another, uh, strengthening one another. Remember, there's like 32 one another's in the New Testament, and it's all about body ministry. And so right now, here in Exodus chapter 4, it looks like everything's going to plan according to plan. Moses and his wife, his two sons are heading back to Egypt. Now look at verse 21. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. So I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But if, you will, uh, but if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So again, this is the second time we've seen this general outline that God gives to Moses about what's going to happen. He's going to tell Pharaoh these things. Pharaoh's going to be hard in his heart. 
and then God's going to harden his heart. By the way, don't get hung up by the fact that it says God will harden Pharaoh's heart. When we get to chapter 7 through 12 and the 10 plagues that God brings against the Egyptians, when you see the first five plagues, after each one of those plagues, Pharaoh's about to let the Israelites go, and then it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then we get to the sixth through the tenth plagues, then it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In other words, God is letting Pharaoh go the way Pharaoh's determined to go. God will do that with us. If you're determined to resist the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit, and you say, I'm going to reject what God's telling me to do, eventually he's going to say, okay, I'll let you go the direction you want to go. And we'll see that God basically tells Pharaoh, if you want to continue to rebel against me, then my spirit of conviction is going to be withdrawn completely from you. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do to people today? It's John chapter 16, verse 8. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is very clear when he says when he comes, when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But once again, if a person continues to reject God, they continue to resist the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, eventually God may give them over to a depraved mind. And that's a scary thing. That's a scary place to be. But over and over in Romans 1, we read of a human and their heart going from bad to worse. And it says there in Romans 1, a couple places, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And then it gets further down, it goes to Romans 1, and it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And so you just see this devolution away from God where they start worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Sound like the new green deal or what? I mean, everybody's wanting to worship Mother Earth. But as we saw in the book of Revelation, Father God has the final say. He will destroy so-called Mother Earth, but he's going to create a whole new heaven and a whole new earth in the future. Now, as we know, God loves everybody. Jesus is a propitiation for all sin, not for ours only, but for all the, the sins of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 tells us. We know that God doesn't desire for any to perish. He loves everybody. Unfortunately, most people reject the Lord. Most people are on a fast track to the lake of fire. Unless they come to Christ and they surrender their life to Jesus, they will be lost for eternity. That's not God's desire, but we know that's the plan. We know that's what's going to happen. Jesus says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on that path. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Why is it narrow? Because it's only through Jesus Christ. You're being narrow-minded. Yes, I am, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So it's narrow because Jesus is the only way of salvation. God gives Moses the outline of what he will face in Egypt, but check out this really bizarre scene in verse 24. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment, that the Lord met him, met Moses, and sought to kill him. Wait a minute. Then Zipporah, that's his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, that's Eliezer, the secondborn, and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he, the Lord, let him go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. What in the world is going on here? I mean, Moses is obeying the Lord. Moses is stepping out in faith, but God is about to kill him? Again, what's going on? There's a lot of different opinions about this, but this much should be clear. Again, if you're going to serve the Lord, your home better be in order. Let me explain. Evidently, Moses, as the head of the house, has neglected to circumcise his second-born son, and by now he's probably in his 30s. You're supposed to do that 
when you're eight days old. Every Jew, every little baby Jewish boy, when they're eight days old, would be circumcised. Was Moses to know that? Absolutely. The Jews have been doing this for over 400 years. It was the covenant God gave to Abraham on the eighth day. Circumcise your little baby boys. And so God commanded that. This was a, a sign of their sanctification to the Lord. Now, apparently, as they get close to Egypt, Moses gets extremely sick, and it appears his life is hanging in the balance because it says the Lord sought to kill him. However that looked, his wife Zipporah, she connects the dots and immediately takes a sharp a stone, I don't know how sharp you can get it. I guess it had to be pretty sharp. And she circumcises their grown son, throws the foreskin at his feet, and says, you're a husband of blood to me. And then God lets Moses go. In other words, as soon as Eliezer is circumcised, then Moses is healed of whatever God struck him with. Some people might wonder, how could that be so important? Well, remember what I said earlier. If you're faithful in the little things, God will bring the increase. If you're not faithful in those little things, God cannot go further in ministry with you. And so to God, this was not a little thing. This physical act of circumcision was an outward sign that you were part of God's family and the promises that went with that reality. I'm an Israelite. I'm chosen by God. This is a sign of that covenant. And don't forget this important truth about circumcision. It speaks of that covenant relationship of God with the Jews. It symbolizes a cutting away of the flesh so that we might walk after the things of the Spirit. That's the bottom line when it comes to circumcision. Moses knew this, but for some reason he neglected to circumcise his second son, and so he has been willfully disobedient in this little area. <laughs> and, and so God won't let him move forward until it's dealt with. Now, that might be true for some of you in here this morning. Maybe God has placed something on your heart, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It seems like you're stuck. Maybe it's because there's an area in your life that needs to be repented of surrendered over to the Lord. Maybe there's some type of sin that you haven't confessed to the Lord. When we have known things in our life and we're still holding on to them and God says, no, you need to let it go. If we don't let it go, you're quenching the Holy Spirit within you. That's what Paul tells us. In this situation, Moses has let Zipporah take the lead in this spiritual matter in the home. And to her, and remember, she's a Gentile, she thinks this is some barbaric idea, circumcising our son. This is ridiculous. And so for however many years, maybe 30 years, Eliezer has been alive, Moses has dropped the ball as the leader of his home in this area of his life. But both the husband and wife need to accept and fulfill the roles and responsibilities that God has placed in the marriage. If we don't have a proper order in our homes, then we will hinder the work of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in ministry. It's very basic. It always begins in the home, any type of ministry. I always like to point out that the outline for a good godly marriage, it's Ephesians chapter 5, and it starts off in Ephesians 5.18. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation or wastefulness, but be filled. That literally means be being filled, continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when the husband and wife are both walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit is being produced in our lives, there'll be love, there'll be joy, there'll be peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Everything else God calls us to do will be a piece of cake in a sense when we're doing things in the power of His Spirit and not in our flesh. So then when you get to verse 21 of chapter 5, the next thing is you're filled with the Spirit, He says, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, in the fear of God. In other words, only God is the supreme authority. We as a husband and wife are under His headship under his authority first and foremost and only then when you're walking in the the spirit 
do the following verses apply and make sense and are able to be lived out, starting in chapter 5, verse 22 of Ephesians. This is what God tells uh, the Apostle Paul to write, and, he, and he's very clear here. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And that means everything that is godly and good. If a husband ever said, okay, go sin, we need some extra money, then the wife would say, absolutely not. Why? Because I must obey God rather than men. So he's not saying you're inferior as a wife. Don't ever have that thought in your head, husband, your wife is inferior. She's not. Elizabeth's a lot smarter than I am in a lot of ways. But that's the order God established. Just like you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, there's order. Even in the church, there's order. You know, Jesus is the head of the church, and he places elders, and all of us are here, but it's order. God is a God of order. So first of all, wives, submit to your own husbands, not because you're inferior, but this is God's plan for successful marriage. Verse 25, here's the husband's role. Husbands, love your wives. That's agape. How can you have agape love? That comes from the Holy Spirit. Well, you better be filled up with the Holy Spirit if you're going to love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And so that's really the outline for successful marriage. So Moses and Zipporah's marriage was a little out of order, and God is going to give them a timeout <laughs> for about a year. They're going to have a time out. Zipporah will take the boys back to her dad's home, Jethro's house, and we'll see the family will be reunited in chapter 18. So husbands, be careful. We need to set the spiritual tone in our homes. God wants us to step up, be a strong, loving, godly man, a man of God within our homes. And spiritual circumcision is still a very important practice that all Christians need to be aware of, not just men, but all of us need to be aware of spiritual circumcision. In other words, anytime anything fleshly starts to cling to you or your heart, you cut it away. You get rid of it. That's what spiritual circumcision is all about. You humble yourself before the Lord. You repent. That's spiritual circumcision. If you don't, it'll hinder the things that God wants to do in and through your life. If there is anything like pornography in the home, get rid of it. Cut it away. If there's anything like alcohol or drug abuse or anything sinful, cursing, whatever it might be, get it out of your home. I mean, what Moses did, or in this case, what Moses did not do halted the plan of God to deliver 3 million people from bondage for however long this season was out there in the wilderness. So God, to him, it's a big deal. But by God's grace, uh, by his mercy, his plan is now back on track. Um, speaking of spiritual circumcision, this is what Paul says in Romans 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in a letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And so spiritual circumcision, cut out those things that are a stumbling block, a hindrance in your life. Jesus said the same thing, hey, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Now, is he talking literally? No. Pluck out your eyes. Pluck, cut off your tongue. Cut off your hands. Cut off your feet. If I cut off everything that would be, you know, that I stumbled over the years, I'd be a stump. It's a spiritual cutting away is what he's talking about. Now the scene shifts a little bit, and God is going to speak to Moses' older brother, Aaron. Look at verse 27. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness and meet Moses. So he went and met on the, the mountain of God, met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron 
all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And remember, this was not God's perfect will to have Aaron involved. God's perfect will is, Moses, I'm choosing you. You alone are going to go and stand before Pharaoh. You're going to do these miracles, these signs that I give you, and you're going to lead my people out. And Moses kept saying, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then finally, send somebody else. And God was angry. He says, a fire was kindled against Moses. Anger from the Lord. And he says, okay, your brother Aaron, he can speak well. And then he lets Aaron come alongside of him. That wasn't God's perfect will, but this is God's permissive will. God wants us to hear. God wants us to obey. One way or another, God will always accomplish his plans and purposes. But if we just did what God wants us to do from the beginning, I'm sure things would go a lot smoother. There would be less complications. So anyway, the brothers reunite. Aaron is 83 years old. Moses is 80 years old. And so these two seasoned citizens are going to be used by God to deliver about 3 million Jews from bondage in Egypt. God will use them for his glory. We know Aaron will eventually become uh, the high priest, the first high priest in Israel. Look at verse 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. So here again, this is supposed to be Moses talking to all the elders. These are all the tribal leaders, the 12 tribes of Israel, the leaders there. It should have been Moses talking, but Aaron's telling these guys what Moses told him to say. Then he, this is Moses, did the signs in the midst of the people, so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So long, uh, I mean, eventually God gets him where he wants him to be. But he's been gone. Moses has been gone for 40 years. And he meets the Jewish elders and... I'm sure it's a little bit awkward because I don't know if these guys ever knew Moses because when Moses was about three or four years old, that's when he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and he was trained in the ways of the Egyptians for the next almost 40 years. And then he kills that Egyptian that was beating up the Jewish man. And when Pharaoh hears that Moses killed an Egyptian, he wants to kill Moses. So that's why Moses fled for 40 years. So he hasn't seen these guys in probably, who knows what, 70 plus years. But now he's back. And through Aaron, he tells them, God has visited me. Uh, God spoke to me from a burning bush. And they're probably rolling their eyes. But then it says he performed the signs that God told him to perform. Remember, take your staff, throw it down, and it became a serpent. Pick it by the tail, and it became a staff again. Take your hand, put it in your bosom. When you pull it out, it's leprous. Eaten away with leprosy. Put it back in, and God healed it. And then the third one was take water out of the Nile, pour it out, and it turns to blood. So when they see that, they get excited. They realize God is here. He is hearing what we've been going through. He's been watching over us. And it says they bowed their heads and worshiped. That's a natural res response when you realize, wow, God does care. God does love me. Jesus does want to save me. I mean, when I got saved, and I realized, I'm a sinner, I'm on a fast track to the lake of fire, but Jesus died for me. He shed his blood on the cross for my sins. And he, I received him as my Lord and Savior. And from that moment on, it's like, how can you not worship the Lord and thank him for everything he's done? Praise God for who he is, that he'd save a wretch like me. And most of you in here. But he saved us. And so we worship him. We praise him. He gave us eternal life. He set us free from all of our sins. And so as things settled down this day, I can just picture Moses and Aaron, they're high-fiving all these uh, elders and like, God's going to deliver us. Yeah, we're out of Egypt in a week or two. But they didn't realize things are going to go from bad here to much worse before they actually leave. And they actually will be another 9 to 12 months in Egypt. 
and it's going to be a tough time. So quickly, let's go through chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. So now they have their official meeting with Pharaoh. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. I mean, this must have been a little surreal for Moses. Again, he grew up in this palace for almost 40 years. And now he's standing before Pharaoh. Many believe that Moses would have been the next Pharaoh if he hadn't killed that Egyptian. But here he is standing before Pharaoh after 40 years. And here's the difference. And now he's a follower of Yahweh. Now he's a follower of the Lord God Almighty. And what a difference this makes. Look at verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And, and notice it's in capital letters, L-O-R-D, that's Yahweh. Nor will I let Israel go. So he's not a very sincere seeker here, is he? You know, I don't know this God you're talking about. I'm not going to let you go. Why would I do that? In his mind, Pharaoh thinks, He's superior to the Jews because they're my slaves. Pharaoh thought of himself as a god, the, the, the son of Ra, the sun god. That's what the Pharaohs believed. And so I've got them as slaves, so how big is their god since they're obeying me? Their god's nothing. That's how Pharaoh looks at the one true living god. He'll have his mind changed eventually, but this guy is one stubborn cookie. But there's a lot of people in the world today just like that. Who is this God you keep talking about? Why would I bow down to him? Who's this Jesus character you keep telling me about? What do I need to listen to that guy for? Well, because he is God and he alone has the keys to heaven or hell. You better listen. Look at verse 3. So they said, Moses and Aaron, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So they're being very polite here. Please let us go just three days' journey into the desert. We just need to sacrifice to our God. That's a reasonable request. The king of Egypt, verse 4, said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, again, almost three million, and you make them rest from their labor. And so he's not even going to entertain the idea. This shows us how stubborn Pharaoh's heart is. This is a reasonable request. You think he might cooperate with the Jews? You know, he's been working them literally to death. In fact, you know, if he gave them a little time out, a little time off, maybe they'd come back and work harder. But Pharaoh was going to have to learn the hard way that God Almighty is the one true God. He's infinitely greater and higher than any of the pagan gods of Egypt. So look at verse 6. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. And so Pharaoh's quick response to Moses' request Make it even harder for the people here. You know what God's perspective is on this? Pharaoh, you better be careful. These are my people. You've enslaved my people. You've kidnapped my children. If you don't let my people go, you are going to face my wrath. And Pharaoh's going to learn the hard way. I'm going to declare war on Egypt is kind of what God will tell him. That's what God's saying to our nation. If we don't humble ourselves before the Lord and repent as a nation, we're in big trouble. Everything we do is contrary to the ways of God. So we will reap what we've sown. Verse 10, And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. 
Go, get yourself straw where you can find it. Yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, Fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today, as before? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, these are the Israelites, the leaders that are overseeing this project, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants. And they say to us, Make brick? And indeed your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. Now there's some interesting things going on in these verses. First of all, Pharaoh thinks he's a god, so everybody has to obey him and listen to him. But on a practical note, he's got over a million Jewish men who are his labor force. And they didn't have to extract any taxes. They just extracted everything from the Jewish people. You know, you think our government's bad. We're going to take taxes from you. We're going to make, you know, this is typical though of any government. They'll take, take, take all they can get. And none of those politicians will lift a finger to do anything. They'll just tell whatever, everybody else what to do. You work, you supply for me, and we got these senators, we got these presidents. Where do they get these four or five mansions? Millions of dollars each one on a government salary? That's, it blows me away how they make some extra money on the side. So they get wealthy off of others who actually do the work they aren't willing to do. And so Pharaoh looks at Moses as a troublemaker. He, he's, he, Mo, Pharaoh's saying, yes, that Moses guy, he's putting these thoughts in your head that you guys should be free, that you should be able to go out and worship your God. And in Satan's world, Satan cannot have that take place. So prior to Moses showing up, the Egyptians, they supplied the Jews with all the straw. They would take the straw, mix it with the clay, and that's how they formed their bricks. Now, they said, well, we're not going to supply you with any straw. you got to go get your own. So they find stubble. And they'll dig up roots. They'll find whatever they can to mix with the clay. And it's not a good thing. They have the same quota put upon them. Now they're having to do a lot more work. And so Pharaoh wants the Jews to gather up their own straw, keep the same number of bricks, if they didn't meet their quota, then they were beaten. Sounds like slavery to me. So many nations have been involved in this. But it's interesting that in the two major cities that the Jews built during this time in Egypt, Pithom and Ramses, archaeologists have discovered that when they dig down, they find the first layers of all their buildings had bricks made with straw. The next layer had all these bricks with stubble and roots in them. The top layer just had clay, nothing mixed in. So archaeologists actually give us evidence of what the Bible says is true. Now another thing worth noting here is in verse 15, it says the officers of Israel cried out to Pharaoh. In other words, they're so spiritually beaten down at this point, they don't, they don't even realize God is with them. God cares for them. God wants to bless them. And so they cry out to Pharaoh and not to God. How often do we do that? Again, watch a little news, whether it's CNN or Fox, doesn't matter. You can put any of them on. And after about 10 minutes, I'm like, ah, ah you stupid politician. Ah, 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 cry out. No, we need to pray for our leaders. You can pray like David. God, just kick him in the teeth. I don't care. Just pray the way God puts on your heart. But I mean, we, 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 we're supposed to pray for our politicians. Anyway, sorry. Um, sorry, not sorry. But how does Pharaoh respond to their cry? Look at verse 17. But he said, you are idle. Idle, therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, go now and work, for no straw shall be given you. Yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it and said, You shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. 
Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron, who stood there to meet them. They're like, how'd it go, guys? <laughs> and they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge. And, you know, this is what they're telling Moses and Aaron. Because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So they cry out to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh basically says, well, it's Moses' fault. So now they go to Moses and say, hey, this is your fault. To them, this was the last straw. Okay, some of you got the first service, only one person got that. Still not enough to repeat, so I won't use that again. Anyway, they're actually fighting a spiritual battle again with fleshly methods. They're all mad at Moses. They're all mad at Aaron. But all that does is make things worse. We should always go to the Lord first. Whatever issue we have, whatever problem we have, take it to the Lord first. 2 Corinthians 10 Starting in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And so always remember, the battle belongs to the Lord. Seek Him first and foremost. Now what's amazing to me is what Moses does not do he doesn't respond in anger. I mean, I, I, I've been known to do that over the years. Somebody would be mad and yell at me, and I was like, Arr! I mean, I used to throw baseballs at guy's head as a pitcher at San Diego State on purpose. You know, so God's still cutting things out of my life. That's why I don't have any baseballs in here, so you guys can say whatever you want. You don't have to worry. But he doesn't respond in anger. You know, they're mad at him. They're blaming Moses. So what does he do? He doesn't say anything. Verse 22, so Moses returned to the Lord. That's a good thing to do. But notice how troubled he is, hurting, confused. He says, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. So obviously he's bummed out, he's discouraged, he's basically saying, why, Lord, why did you send me? Everybody's mad at me. They want to shoot the messenger. I only did what you told me to do. But here's the amazing thing. Moses is right smack dab in the middle of God's will. In other words, things don't always go the way that we think they should go. That's life. Some things are just out of our control. Even when we're doing God's will, even when we're obeying God's word, you might lose a job. You might have somebody walk out on you. You might get sick. You might get hurt. But this is when we need to walk by faith and realize God is not done. He's not done with Moses here. In fact, look at the very first verse of chapter 6. We're not going to look at it much, but it just says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. So you haven't seen the whole picture yet, Moses. You're just focused on they're mad, they're upset, they don't see what's going on here. You haven't seen what I'm going to do yet. And so often that's where we are in life. We get hurt, we get discouraged, we get bummed out, something happens in our family, and that's all we can see is right in front of us. But God's not done the best is yet to come. It looks bad for Moses right now, but read ahead. God is going to do some amazing stuff very soon. And Moses is going to be blown away. But even if everything in your life for 80 or 90 years, however long you live to be, even if everything, as a Christian, everything's going wrong, everything's going bad, so what? What? you got eternity with Jesus in glory. That's the bottom line. It's not your best life now. Joel Osteen got it wrong. This is not our best life. Our best life is when we stand in the presence of Jesus and see him face to face in our resurrection bodies. People always question God. They get mad at God. Why this? Why, why not? We live in a fallen world. We're all going to die unless the rapture takes us home before. But... 
This is what life is all about, serving the Lord, living for the Lord, hearing Him say when we get to glory, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. It's not about what I can get out of this life before I die. It's not who dies with the most toys that wins. That's a lousy bumper sticker. It's who dies with Jesus. That's the bottom line. You might have a short life. I mean, I think of Keith Green. Remember, he was 28 years old when he died in that plane crash with his two kids, Josiah and Bethany. That's where our daughter got her name from, their daughter, Bethany. I mean, it grieved me. I was a young Christian when he died. I'm like, oh, Lord, why? I don't know why. He lived for Jesus for 28 years. Well, no, he lived for Jesus for about seven years. You know, and then the Lord takes him home. Some other people, they might live to be 100 years old. Moses lived to be 120. It doesn't matter. You know, it's not the birth date and the end date. It's that little dash in between. Are you living for Christ? And hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant, or are you wanting to live for the applause of men? This world is fickle. People are fickle. I do this to be pleasing to the Lord. If anybody gets anything out of this, praise the Lord. And so I've tuned people out over the years like, yeah, they got a lot of criticisms. They got to, they, they, you know, they point out, oh, he wears Hawaiian shirts. What's wrong with this guy? How come there's no stained glass? I mean, you can come up with any kind of weird reason you want, but God's word is the final authority. And he doesn't want you being discouraged and bummed out and just throwing in the towel. He says, no, I am with you always. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm all that you need for life and victory. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because. Oh, good.